My name is Greg Peterson, and I welcome one and all to uh, another one of those extraordinary evenings at the Robert H. Jackson Center. Uh, it's been a little more than five years since we started this uh, endeavor, and much has happened, but tonight is really extra special. Extra special for several reasons, uh, and all of you who are here today are of a particular role in this, partic in this event this evening. We'll be, the, the pecking order is, we're going to talk a little bit about a wonderful and extraordinary gift, a little bit of serendipity which led to a gift, which is over here. Uh, as you know, this is the conclusion of a particular phase in this construction, and Raleigh Kidder will pause and reflect on all those who made that possible. And then we have a real special part of the program, which is the introduction and display of the Harold Jackson Adams exhibit, which we're really very excited about displaying, of which you'll be the first to see tonight. First, let me recognize a few guests. Of course, our special guests, Harold and Mariana Adams. Thank you very much for making a special effort here tonight. Uh, Harold and Mariana's daughter, we have Paula and David Stearns. Paula, thank you very much. We have Harold's cousin, Karen Ingeman. Karen? And Robert Jackson's grandson and his wife, Tom and Phyllis Loftus, who came up from Virginia a few minutes ago. So thank you. A story. A story that involves several players, many of them in the audience tonight. It started on May 17th, 2003, when a professor from St. Bonaventure named John Neeson was traveling on his way to Buffalo. And as he was listening to NPR, a station he doesn't often always listen to, but nevertheless was listening, there was the dedication of the Robert H. Jackson Center and the principal speaker was Chief Justice William Rehnquist. That was imprinted on John Neeson. And John, if you want to wave, just because I'm going to talk about you here for a second. <laughs> for it was the same John Neeson who in July, June, July, summer in Germany was um, having a, a, a repast with his uh, daughter and son-in-law Son-in-law was Major Michael Blahovic. Major Michael Blahovic uh, from the Bamberg Army Base. And during the course of the conversation, while John was talking about what was going on in the Southern Tier, talked about the Jackson Center, talked about the event of William, William Rehnquist, only to learn from Major Blahovic that, in fact, on the Bamberg Army Base was a relic, a relic which was in the form of a desk, a desk that was used by one Robert H. Jackson at Nuremberg. And all of a sudden, that became a little piece of information which John dutifully brought back, and brought back and called the Robert Jackson Center and said, oh, by the way, the desk of Robert Jackson is at the Bamberg Army Base. Well, of course, that doesn't, that's not lost on us. In January of 2004, John Barrett and I, together with Warren Erickson, were invited to go to Nuremberg. Our, my first trip, John's first trip, Warren had been there many times, with an eye towards seeing that place where Justice Jackson had some of his finest hours. And we made arrangements through John Neeson, son-in-law Michael Blahovic, to get special security clearance to get ourselves onto the Bamberg Army base. We got there, we saw it, and through Michaels and his uh, superior officer, Colonel Spindler, I believe. Colonel Spindler, uh, they s kept it in a side area and said, for business reasons, we should probably find it a more appropriate place than this base, because at some point, somewhere, this may be discarded. We took lots of pictures, got all excited, but we also knew it was un in the ownership of the Army. The question is, now what? I come back all loaded with excitement, and I'm sitting down and having a 
our morning Jamestown Jammers Professional Baseball's Advisory Committee. Our chairman, I gotta follow the dots here a little bit. The chairman of that committee is retired Lieutenant Colonel Paul Farding. Paul, would you raise your hand? <laughs> Unbeknownst to me, I get excited. I'm telling about the desk, the desk. And I look at Paul and I say, you're chairman. You're chairman of getting this desk out from the Army. Now, only I knew that he was a lieutenant colonel retired. I didn't know the, how, what connections he had. But little did I realize that Paul had a connection with a four-star general, General Cody. Now, the game changes. Now, Paul comes said that day and says, can you give me some information? So I march him right over to my office, give him the information. Paul dutifully and, and gets right on the email, fires off this information to General Cody. Uh, then things start happening. And all of a sudden, we get a letter from the Army, but we find that it's now, uh, and I might introduce also a re retired Lieutenant Colonel Lippincott, who's next to Paul there, and thank you very much. <laughs> I blew it, Colonel Lippincott, thank you. Um, so it, the, the, it was extreme, the amount of steps we had to go through. So Paul, once again, intervened. Paul once again sent another note to uh, uh, General Cody and all of a sudden that laser note, is that the term? Laser, all of a sudden, <laughs> things started to free up. And so all of a sudden if the notice came that the desk would be available at Bamberg. Well, all right, well that's great, that's in Germany. Now what? How do we get it off and how do we get it here? So enter Bush Industries. Enter Jackie MacArthur and Ernie Artisa. Wave your hand. <laughs> Bush Industries has a plant in Germany. So I call, in fact, I may have seen you at Walmart or something, Ernie, and said, you're the chairman of getting the thing over here. <laughs> Again, little did I realize that afternoon, phone calls started to be made. Jackie made calls over there to the plant, and all of a sudden, a triangular events where Jackie from Faulkner would call over to their plant in Germany, which is about two hours from Bamberg, and somehow they connected, and one day, I'll never forget it, I forget if it was Jackie or Ernie, called me and said, we got it. So they got it. Now what does that mean? That means it's off the Army base and on its way to Bush Industries in Germany. And we had no idea, to be honest with you, when this would occur, but we knew at least it was in private hands, and I liked it a lot. So a few months went by, and then all of a sudden, uh, a phone call from Ernie saying, it's here. It's in Chautauqua County. Well, the next day, Paul Fardink, Warren Erickson, Greg Peterson met the uh, desk, which was wrapped up as if it was Tutankhamun's, uh, you know, sarcophagus. You know, it was 80 layers, right? I mean, it was unbelievable. This was the uh, unbelievable relic that Bush Industries wasn't gonna, was going to make sure that in fact was here. So then all of a sudden, it came. So we came, and there are pictures floating around of Warren Erickson, Paul Fardink, Greg Peterson, crawling on their backs, their stomachs, looking at everything humanly possible under this thing. Now, what you're going to see here is this desk. And in a minute, I'm going to call up uh, General Wellman to come join us to talk uh, and to make a presentation. But before that, the desk you see was not in exactly the, what you'll be seeing, what, how it came here. And there is another person who needs to raise her hand because we're going to ooh and ah when we do see it, Susan DiFazenzo, who took the desk. So, Susan. So, <laughs> and therefore she took it, made it look like what it is today. Uh, a magic piece for the Jackson Center. Uh, and I can't wait for the conclusion of this because in just a second, somebody will actually present it to us. So with all those people, you can just see how it went from John Neeson, Major Blahovic, I might, John Barrett, it went all the way from Paul Fardink, General Cody, Jackie MacArthur, Ernie Artista, Susan DiFacenzo, to Barkley Wellman. So Barkley, come on up. Thanks, Greg. Uh, gives me a great deal of pleasure to be part of this dedication ceremony, being from Jamestown. 
And uh, so much has happened with the Robert H. Jackson Center in five short years. I'm, I'm just amazed at, at what occurs. And as Greg said, a, a little something happens, and you hear something someplace, and all of a sudden it, it just occurs. It's just it's fan, fantastic. Anyway, uh, you heard the story and how they had to get up pretty high. Four stars is as high as it gets in the Army. And uh, I've got a letter here from General Cody, whose current title is Vice Chief of Staff. That's second in command in the Army. Uh, to Rollin Kidder, dear Mr. Kidder, thank you for the invitation to attend your dedication ceremony of the desk used by Supreme Court Justice uh, Robert H. Jackson in his role as Chief American Prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials following World War II. Unfortunately, as I have stated previously, I will be unable to attend. While I could not be present to dedicate the desk, it was my pleasure to assist in recovering this important piece of history for display and exhibit. The Robert H. Jackson Center is an outstanding institution devoted to educating the American people on the way justice should be served. Sincerely, Richard A. Cody, General, United States Army. Quite a letter. Uh, briefly, I just wanted to bring you up to date on a few other things uh, before we move ahead with the program. Uh, we are, as you can see coming in tonight, in, still in the midst of a construction program. We're putting down some beautiful flagstone out there in that uh, entrance room. We have heat there now. It's going to be, I think, a, a real nice place to leave your coats when it's cold in the wintertime, but it's not quite done tonight. Uh, starting the 27th of November, uh, scaffolding will start going up in this auditorium. There will be sprinklers in here. There will be a newly painted ceiling. The seats you're sitting in will be moved out, and it won't be quite like climbing a mountain when you go up those steps anymore. We're going to try and make it a little easier for you to sit in this auditorium. But uh, that will be beginning. But tonight I wanted to especially talk about what you're going to see afterwards. You're going to go into our new exhibit and archive and research rooms, uh, which we've been working on, I'd say, for the past six months. And I just wanted to uh, talk about some of the people who've made things happen out there. Uh, first of all, for, for the exhibit professionals who've put the exhibit together, you're going to see tonight, and if they'd raise their hand so we could recognize them, uh, Joni Blackman, director at the Fenton History Center. Is Joni here? Help us on top. <laughs> uh, I didn't see him, but I think he's going to, was said he was going to be here, James O'Brien. Director of the McClurg Museum. Dave Anderson of Streetwise Creative Group. He's and a, a, a consultant representing the Jackson Center in this effort, Linda Cowan. Uh, we had a wonderful contractor in this job. E.E. E. Austin and Company, they have, they're here in Jamestown as well as Erie, Pennsylvania. And Dustin Damcott is here, representing E.E. E. Austin. <laughs> By the way, there's somebody from Austin who's not here. His name is Brian Venn. And he's, we decided to delay the start of the next construction job till the 27th of November because we want Brian Venn back on this job. And he's not here tonight. But uh, when you walk out of that door and you see the new uh, uh, oak paneling that's right behind the area where he had a drink and so forth that leads into the new exhibit room. That was all Brian Venn. And uh, he's a terrific guy and uh, we're happy he's coming back. Our, our architects for this job were Habitat and Associates and Dave Walder and Randy Beckrinker here representing the company. <laughs> uh, Jim McIntyre uh, with the electrical contractor and that is here. 
Uh, Alstrom, Schaefer, Electric, and uh, I don't think King's Heating is here, but maybe they are. The King's Heating? Okay. Uh, and finally, I wanted to mention, uh, we wouldn't have done any of this without some funding. And I, Bill Parman's not here, but he helped us in getting a New York State Community Capital Assistance Grant, and the Ralph C. Sheldon Foundation of Jamestown helped us. So that everybody who made that room possible, I want to thank you very much here tonight. And finally, uh, for this little part of the program, um, I wanted to say that once this exhibit opens tonight, it's going to be open for the public here in Jamestown. And you came in the door out here and probably came this way tonight. But if you have a little time after we're done with our official program and you have time to, to go back in the, other, in the old mansion, we're decorated for Christmas. And you might like to see the old mansion here at the Jackson Center when it's decorated for Christmas. It's pretty spectacular. And we've had many, many people in the community that run florist shops and others here to decorate. So uh, tell your friends before New Year's, they better get down to the Jackson Center and take a look at this place. So I think, Greg, that wraps it up for me at this point. The person we're here to honor, Harold Adams. Harold, we all have stories about Harold, but let me talk a little bit about the Jackson Center part of the Harold Adams story. It predates the Jackson Center. For 1999, I had a chance to sit down and interview Harold Adams. And it was a two-hour interview, and it basically jettisoned me into an area of interest called Robert H. Jackson. And Harold used to hang around you know, the banks and we'd see them around, so, but never connected the two. And when I thought that was kind of uh, a nice connection, then I thought I would historical curiosity. So I think you're one of my first interviews, Earl, and certainly the first one on Jackson, which ultimately led to, uh, of all things, we put together a, my first video, if you imagine. Uh, we showed at a hot stove lunch in Paul, dealing with baseball, we took a day off and talked about Nuremberg, if you can imagine. So there was the segue, John, between baseball and Robert Jackson. We have yet to find any other connections at all. When the Jackson Center was started, uh, literally at, right here, right here with uh, Carl Kappa, Betty Linnae, Dan Braddon, and Harold Adams, uh, in January of 2001, it was a magic moment, and Harold was right there, and after Betty and uh, Carl had, or Carl and then Betty had expressed their interest in participating in something called the Jackson Center and financially participating, and we talked at great lengths. It was Harold who buttonholed a guy named Dan Bratton. It was Harold who sat down and they talked, and it was uh, Dan who then said, you know, this is really something special. He got to know Harold. He got to actually hold and touch a person who was a Jackson relative. And the next day, Dan Bratton climbed on board as our first executive director. So we had Carl, we had Betty, we had Dan, we had the Gebby Foundation folks here, and we had Harold working this crowd. And the last thing we said as we were leaving here was Harold says, I want to just say something quickly, and you point it. You may not even recall this, but it's in the memo. You point it upstairs, and I'm sure my uncle would concur with everything that transpired here today. And that was the end of our magic moment where everything came together in January of 2001. Now, it was a secret that this Jackson Center was proceeding. It was a secret because we weren't sure the Masons were going to agree to sell this place. So we kept it undercover until the first, the very first speech on behalf of this incorporated Robert H. Jackson Center occurred in the town of Carroll, the town of Carroll Historical Society. And who gave that speech? Harold Jackson Adams, the first. So, so many parts of the, along the way, Harold Jackson Adams was the first. And it included being on the first board and being one of the charter members of the board and continues to be on the board, having witnessed a whole lot of things that have occurred in this last five years. Now, I have listened to Harold and videotaped Harold, and probably some of you don't know all there is to know about Harold, so we're going to pause now and show a brief little video of Harold Adams, according 
to Harold Adams. I really appreciate uh, your invitation to be here tonight because this community holds a very warm spot in my heart. Firstburg was my birthplace. In fact, I uh, well may be one of the last uh, to have been born here uh, rather than in the Jamestown Hospital. Firstburg is where I grew up and I am probably one of the last of those who, whose uh, favorite boyhood hangout was Ed Scheinborn's blacksmith shop. Fruisberg is where as a teenager I set pins in the bowling alleys owned by Henry Kyle and Ralph Whittle. And uh, where I went to the movies uh, once or twice a week at the old Garfield Theater, uh, now the site of quality markets. It was Frewsburg High School that allowed me to become a graduate in 1945. And uh, Frewsburg was the home of a cute little classmate named Mary Anna Gearhart, who seven years later became my first and only wife. So you see, I'm a Frewsburg product and proud to be so. Now, of course, the reason you came tonight is to hear about another Frewsburg boy Robert Howard Jackson. Throughout his life, Robert Jackson was very close to his family here, especially to his mother, his sister Helen, and later to his favorite and only nephew, Harold Jackson Adams. I remember many holiday celebrations at the Jackson home on Fairmont Avenue in Jamestown. I remember going horseback riding with him cruising on his boat, the Alibi, going on picnics, driving around the countryside in his Buick convertible, and climbing Jackson Hill with him. In my senior year at Frewsburg High, Principal Leland Sanborn asked if I would write and invite Justice Jackson to speak at our commencement in June. On April 16, 1945, I received this note from him. Dear Harold, I have your letter, and if ever I had any reluctance about coming to Frewsburg High School to make a speech, you have melted it. I would like to come and will try to do so, but I cannot give you an ironclad guarantee just now. Subject to the hazards of the time and the demands of my office, I shall accept the invitation. But on the 3rd of May, he wrote again. Dear Harold, you have probably seen the announcement of the president that he has asked me to undertake the trial of war criminals. It is a big job and a good deal of it will have to be done in Europe. The chances are that I will not be here by the 26th of June. I shall have to cancel the promise I made to you because much as I want to obey your orders, I have had orders from just a little higher source. <laughs> I didn't, uh, well, I was too damn young to appreciate this, and, and the same as with Nuremberg, you know. Gee, it was great to be there, but I didn't, at the time, appreciate it's being one of the high watermarks in, in human history. Yeah. So. How'd you get there? How'd you get to Nuremberg? Oh, I was, I was uh, stationed uh, near Munich in, uh, First Division. A after the war, I saw no combat. And, uh, so as the, uh, the day it came for the judgment to be pronounced, uh, uh, you you were you knew about it. Uh huh. But 
course, everybody knew about it, and everybody wanted to get there. My uncle had the temporary rank of brigadier general, so he uh, <laughs> got me transferred down there for for a couple of days. No kidding. Yeah, uh -huh. and then arranged for a jeep to uh, pick me up and drive me down. Did you call him? Or did you? Did you lie no, right now? Uh uh. In fact, I didn't. I didn't even know that he was back in uh, in Germany at that point. So the commanding officer called me over and he said, I don't know who the hell you know, but <laughs> you're going to Nuremberg, <laughs> which was nice. And, uh, and uh, let's see, I got there rather late at night and, uh, and uh, overslept the next morning. So everybody was down having breakfast when I, when I came down. And <laughs> so anyway, they were all very nice about it. My coffee, let's see. Mrs. Jimmy Burns poured my coffee that morning, yeah. <laughs> and uh, a bunch of other dignitaries. It was uh, it was great. So uh, the procedure in the morning was to uh, uh, just uh, announce whether they were found guilty or innocent. Uh, and then in the afternoon, uh, they pronounced sentence on the ones who were found guilty. So that was the morning. Then uh, I had lunch that noon in uh, my uncle's uh, chamber uh, with General Lucius Clay. Here am I, a, a PFC, having lunch with General Clay <laughs> <laughs> and my uncle, which was <laughs> quite interesting. <laughs> after the, uh, so after it's all said and done, next day you had to head back? Yes. <laughs> I... Uh, I hitched a ride back, sort of. <laughs> there was a, a liquor convoy going back up to Munich. Yeah. So I got guard duty. <laughs> and that, that was a position of some responsibility. A convoy of booze was, was worth an awful lot of money <laughs> in, in Germany at that time. So I got back to, to uh, Munich without causing additional expense to the American taxpayer. <laughs> Center. And also, we also want to welcome, as Greg already has, uh, Mariana, their daughter Paula, her husband David, their daughter Nancy couldn't be here. She's in Florida with her husband Rob Mason. Karen Ingman, a cousin, is here. And then uh, Tom Loftus is here with his wife Phyllis. He's a grandson of Robert H. Jackson. And uh, it was great to have both of you come down. I'm glad we made it in that van that I drove. It was the first time, you know. You know, well, there's a saying, you know, Harold in Scripture that says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. And I've always felt that Harold Adams must have a lot of wisdom and understanding because I've never met anybody happier who celebrates life more, who always has a positive, upbeat, and encouraging comment to make. However, if there's another word for me that describes Harold, it would be gentleman. Harold, if there's one thing about you that it always hit, has always hit me, is your good nature and your deference towards others. To be with you is to be in the presence of a true gentleman. 
And as we Presbyterians would say, you always do things decently and in order. <laughs> you and I have known each other for many years, but I think we've gotten to know each other better since we've both been involved here at the Jackson Center. It's also been a time when I've been getting know, to know more about your uncle, Robert H. Jackson. Others know better than I, but I would say that many of the things I have been told and read about Robert H. Jackson are things I see in you. When you dress with that shirt, tie, and handkerchief in that spiffy, immaculate way, I can see your Uncle Bob. When you crack one of your wry jokes, I can see the two of you walking in the woods along the Potomac at Hickory Hill or laughing and talking at a family picnic. And so, Harold, I believe you are a chip off the old block, and there's a lot of Jackson in you. There are many experiences that I'm sure you reminisce with with your uncle, but I would imagine that one of, on one of those walks or on one of those summer picnics, you probably told him what a thrill it was that day when you got invited down to Nuremberg for the reading of the judgments. As you said in the film, and I didn't know this was coming up before I wrote these comments, when your commanding officer called you in and according to you, you said, Private Adams, I don't know who the hell you know. <laughs> but there's a vehicle outside waiting for you. Take you to Nuremberg, and off you went in your own private army-owned Jeep in a, to hobnob with General Clay, Uncle Bob Jackson, and other luminaries of the day who were gathered at Nuremberg. But it is in stories like this, which you have told us, that you have conveyed your respect, friendship, and love for your Uncle Bob. And it is in telling these stories and remembering these experiences that you have helped bring him alive for those of us who never had the opportunity to meet him. You have been Bob Jackson's presence here at the new Robert H. Jackson Center, and we are deeply indebted to you for that. The Jackson family exhibit tonight is appropriate name, appropriately named the Harold Jackson Adams Collection. Finally tonight, I want to mention again what a delight it was when this July, you and I spent that wonderful hot afternoon in Betty Sheldon's convertible, which, by the way, Harold hated all those horns going off there for the whole parade. We went to that Frewsburg Gala Day parade together. Here we were driving down the street of Uncle Bob's hometown in your hometown, and I still savor that day, though we were dehydrated from the heat and finally glad to get out of the sun and ultimately needed a shower after it was all over and probably a stiff drink. But Harold, you've had a tremendous, you've been a, a tremendous supporter of this center, and we couldn't have gotten to this point without you. And thank you for being a part of this and for bringing to life the name that graces this place, Robert H. Jackson. Now I'd like to call on Professor John Q. Barrett, no stranger to us, the Elizabeth S. Linnae Fellow, uh, a superstar in our midst, but more importantly, a friend, a friend of the Robert H. Jackson Center uh, and a friend of Harold Adams. John. Thank you very much. I just had the honor of getting up out of a front row seat that's reserved for family. And the reason why I get to sit there is because this family, Tom and Phyllis and Dave and Paula and Mariana and Harold, have made me part of their family. And I owe that to Harold. I was starting to write a law review article about Robert Jackson in 1999. I'd worked in the Department of Justice where his photograph and his portrait graces every major hallway and I'd savored his opinions since I'd first read them as a law student and I knew in general terms the outline of his career and the distinctive Nuremberg achievement that separates him from every other Supreme Court justice in our history. Um, and I needed to write some articles to earn tenure. So I fastened on Justice Jackson and some aspects of his career and at some point a person who I owe a tremendous amount to, and I have no idea who this is, said he has a living nephew. And so I made a telephone call, a call I have the notes of, in December 
and had a lovely conversation with Mr. Adams. He was friendly, he was cordial, he was a gentleman, he was generous, uh, he was appropriately cautious, I was a voice on the phone, but we had a nice conversation and tucked in near the end of that was one of those gentle, typically herald, tremendous gifts. He said, there's a lawyer in Jamestown you might want to talk to. Peterson, Gregory, 716-483-5172. And one thing leads to another. Since that first phone call, and then some months later when I made my first trip up here and Harold and I had our first lunch at the Holiday Inn, um, one wonderful thing has led to another. And now, just a small grievance. Part of what I feel almost every day is a jealousy about Harold Jackson Adams, who has something that I only dream of getting an hour of. And that's a deep personal knowledge of Robert H. Jackson. Um, Bob Jackson had two children, and he had a niece and a nephew, and he had special relationships with his two sisters. I want to focus in that group of immediate family members on two to explain my jealousy, which is a, a jealousy of love. It's not a, it's not a biting jealousy at all. Uh, one is the relationship that Robert Jackson had with his baby sister, Helen. He was born in 1892. She was born in 1904. Their father, William Eldred Jackson, died in 1915 when Bob was just short of his 22nd birthday and a new lawyer, and Helen obviously was still a young girl. And he became her guardian as a matter of legal responsibility and really as a formalizing of the deep personal commitment and bond that big brother and baby sister had. This is not to slight the sister Ella, who was only two years younger than Robert Jackson, but she was an adult of her own right uh, by the time this passing of their father occurred. And frankly, it was a wonderful family, but it was a family that had had some bumps. Uh, Will Jackson and Lina Jackson, wonderful, loving parents, um, had some ups and downs. Will Jackson was a person who had some troubles. Uh, and part of that, I think, shaped and affected their children. And it certainly shaped and affected what Robert Jackson was determined that Helen Jackson would have in her life going forward now that she was his charge. And things flowed from this. One was Robert Jackson not serving in the military during World War I. Just a couple years later, he's still a young man and draft eligible. He is married, and he is the sole support at that point for his wife, Irene, and his mother, Lina, and his still minor sister, Helen. And those dependents uh, are part of the, the process that spares him you know, what could have been death in a trench in France uh, in that decade, in a sense. Um, his bond with his sister, Helen, lasted for his whole life, and in her devoted caretaking of his, of his memory lasted through her long life. And when Helen became a mother, her son Harold became a very, very special part of Robert Jackson's life. Bob Jackson had his own, own son, William Jackson, named for his father, some few years older than Harold. But in a sense, Bill Jackson uh, had lots of things and went on a trajectory that in some ways began to distinguish himself from his father's own upbringing and experience. Bill Jackson lived here until he was 12, but then became a boarding student in Washington, and then his family soon moved there, and he was a tremendous success and climbed a ladder of elite education and experience into the legal profession and a tremendous career and a wonderful long life and family. Um, but Bill Jackson, in the end, although of birth from Jamestown, I wouldn't call a Jamestown boy. I wouldn't really call a Chautauqua County boy. Whereas Bob Jackson, a Warren County boy and a Spring Creek boy, was really a Frewsburg boy and was really a Chautauqua County boy. And for all of the attainments and travels and distance and accomplishments of his life, the core of him was in this soil. And it wasn't just geographic. It was the common sense. It was the outlook. It was the life. It was the experience. It was the affections. It was the decency. It was the humane values. And it was the people. And for him, the core of those relationships that 
always mattered so much to him was family, and particularly Helen and Harold. And now that desk. That desk was not his courthouse desk. His courthouse desk was a piece of, you know, German courtroom, courthouse furniture discarded, I'm sure, many, many decades ago. That was the desk that he actually got work done on because that was the desk in the home that he lived in during the year he was in Nuremberg. And he worked there on the things that mattered most to him because it was quiet. His office was high traffic, staff, allies, meetings, chief prosecutors, lunch with General Clay. That was office stuff, Private Adams too. Um, that was for the office desk. This was the desk on which he did things like draft his opening statement and draft his closing statement and write his letters home to the people he loved. And some of those letters have survived and they're beautiful. Some survived in Justice Jackson's wife's hands because they were home to her at Hickory Hill or in their daughter Mary's hands or in their son Bill's wife's Nancy's hands who was also receiving mail and some survived in the hands of Helen and some survived in the hands of Harold. And one of my very favorites is a letter that Uncle Bob wrote during that summer into the fall of 45 uh, when Harold was not yet PFC Adams, he was still sub PFC, where Bob from a distance, of course no longer the custodian and legally responsible person, but still caring for his sister, writes her very assuring words about how it's going to be safe for her only son to do military service in post-war occupation Germany. And that's a kind of human decency that, as you know, grabs me and defines my work and will be my project and what I get to share with you for as long as you'll have me back. And that's the love of Bob Jackson for Harold. And to get to know Bob Jackson through Harold has been one of the very, very precious gifts of my life. To have Harold Jackson Adams as my friend is a coup. Thank you very much. Ask Harold. Harold asked uh, to uh, say a few words, and we're going to give him the opportunity uh, as he's coming forward. I want to, of course, thank all those and remind everybody that as we conclude this, that there will be a ribbon cutting and the opening of the Harold Jackson Adams exhibit will be uh, shortly thereafter. So, Harold? Yep, yeah, sure. Yeah, he said, don't spill the wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is focused. Uh, what in the world can I say? <laughs> I would like to say thanks to an awful lot of people. First, my thanks to Helen Mary Jackson Adams for making me Robert Jackson's first and only nephew. <laughs> Next, my thanks to Mary Anna Gerhard Adams for putting up with me for 54 years. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Paula Elizabeth Adams Stearns for everything she does for Mariana and me. Sorry about that. Very special thanks to the greatest cameraman this side of Hollywood, Gregory Peterson.
to my chauffeur, Raleigh Kidder. <laughs> to Randy Sweeney. And, and even to my arch nemesis, Carol Drake. Most special thanks of all to Professor John Q. Barrett. <laughs> John is the world's leading authority on Robert H. Jackson and the entire Jackson family. Thanks to the Jackson Center's many generous supporters and tireless volunteers. And my warmest thanks to each of you here tonight. Thank you. Carol, you want the mic? <laughs> With that, wow, um, we stand adjourned, and we will be proceeding over to the lobby area, and there, uh, David and, um, I see Dustin, uh, Raleigh, and I will, together with Harold, will be opening up the uh, exhibit here. Please join us.
It's all Dave. Dave will control. It's always about Dave. Oh, that's looking pretty good. Let's see. Okay, everybody at me. Okay, you want to go ahead and uh, cut the ribbon, Harold and Raleigh? Okay, here we are. This, so we'll turn them right around to you and Marianne, and they can be the first to take a look at things. Oh, Either way. Point in. Okay. <laughs> Being your motor. This is you on the pony. Maybe not. There's you and Buster. And, and maybe we should get you over here by your wife so you can get a look. Even as a young man, Harold, you look good in a tie, but it's not a bow tie. Oh, well, there was the justice of the Okay, okay. He was up. Anyway, you stay here for a while. Yeah, I like it like that. Yeah. I wish I had one to do a lot of time. So he gave me one here. Yeah. And so he had one. This is the 4th of July picnic. It's a very special picture. Yeah. Well, he, he wants to know, Randy, something about he's from the PJ. Go ahead, I'll try it. Go ahead, take care. Sorry, I can remember Oh, is that right? Yeah. How long were you there? Quite a few years. I think 10 or so. Really? Okay. Until it was his job. Yeah. yeah. Chase Manhattan. Well, banking was very different then. It was a lot more personable than it is today. Yeah. Yeah. For the most part, I enjoyed the ride. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was the marketing vice president. Oh, were you? Oh, yeah. So you were on the corner of uh, Main and Third, right? Okay. When did you retire from there? That's the story, anyway. Well, about, uh, about a year after Chase took over. I don't oh, okay. Remember. All right. This looks like a pretty exciting display here. <laughs> Good luck, Tim Buckley. Who was, who was Joy's husband? Uh -huh. And he was killed. He was a tremendous architect. Uh -huh. He did work on the Capitol, or Mayflower Hotel, you name it. He was one of the real best. And by golly, the cops were chasing him. Uh, a driver one night, and they pulled right in. Really? Oh, boy. Yeah. Sad stories you don't want to hear about. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I made See these on the other side here. You see on the side over here? On the left? Yeah, I think, well, I've seen them already. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
You need to keep up with Mariana. So. Right. Yep. <laughs> He's in some of these over here. Yes, he is. Where did the hat come from? You know, you know I don't, I don't know. The what? The hat. We'll have to ask Joni. Something yeah. like this. It's not a hat you recognize, then. No, it's not. It is now. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Maybe, there's little, maybe there's a little liberty taken. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. Well, over a home. <laughs> Thank you. 